Hi, I'm Matt Lieb. And I'm Vince Mancini. And this is Pod, Pod Yourself the Wire. The Wire. A The Wire podcast where Vince Mancini and I go through every single episode of The Wire and, and talk about, about it. it. Thank you once again for listening to the world's only The Wire podcast, The Wire, a show about hating your boss and other things. Um, just a reminder, five stars and a review on the Apple iPod iPodcast store. I don't know what it's called anymore. It's like called podcasts, I think. Uh, and also, once again, we have a uh, Reddit that was created by a listener named Tanglefisk. Uh, so you can go to our pod yourself, the wire, and, uh, you know, talk about it. I, I like when people go on the internet and talk about, you know, the mm -hmm. wire. Yeah, your ears start burning. Like, yeah, oh, that's like, me. The wire, we made that. Yeah. <laughs> that's us. Um, yeah, so go ahead and do that for me and for yourself, because you know what? It's a lot of fun. Isn't that right, Vince? That's right. I don't believe you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> today, we're going to be talking about from season three of The Wire, episode two, All Due Respect, and our guest today, oh boy, ladies and gentlemen and everyone else, you know this guy from the wonderful History of Rome podcast, as well as Revolutions, and soon, coming up, the Duncan & Co. History Show. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Duncan is here. Mike Duncan is, in fact, here. Yes. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Yep. Yeah, yeah, where's the, where's the applause? I got a soundboard. I got, I got all sorts of shit I can do. Great. <laughs> yeah, see, this is, you know, I listen to Revolutions. And uh, I've always noticed that, like, the big problem I've had with it is uh, so many moments where you could do a reggae horn. Mm. Yeah, and you, exactly. And you just, you know, you left it I just, out. I, I kept waiting for the right moment, and it just never oh, showed up, which is why there's no sound effects and no music and no anything in Revolutions or the History of Rome. It's just one guy talking in a monotone voice about yeah. political history. Yeah. Which I, listen, I, I will admit completely that... I love the show, and I also, uh, and I don't know if you've heard this before, I'm sure you have, I fall asleep to it sometimes, not oh, saying sure. that- Oh, no, no, I, no, no, I take that as a compliment. Yeah, it's like this thing where it's like, I just, I, I've listened to the show multiple times, and then at some point I realize that like, oh, this is kind of like good to fall asleep to as well. Yeah. Not like in a way where it's like, oh, it's boring. No, it's just that you have a soothing voice. Whereas yeah, and like it, and and the content is just interesting enough that you you don't tune it out, but then right. it's also soothing enough that it kind of just takes you away to to slumberland. Yeah, 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 it's very soothing content. You know, with the beheadings and whatnot. <laughs> right, and exactly. I I love a good uh you know I I love a good war a World War One type war that just goes on and on. I love the. Uh, you know, all the, the massacres, the many massacres that happen on Sundays and mm, other but days. I, but, I, but I tell it to you like a lullaby. You do. Yeah. You yeah. almost sing it. It's like with yeah. a nice little Irish lilt. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I have yes. that argument with my wife a lot where she likes to fall asleep to things with like a laugh track that, you know, like old sitcoms and stuff. And I, I yeah. need like a good true crime about like murder yeah. or a history podcast about beheadings to really uh, like take my brain away from my uh, reality. And yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been, I've been falling asleep lately to uh, like the old like BBC Poirot series. Oh wow. Moment, oh yeah. Which is, which, is, which is just that it's like, it's all just very chill, you know, <laughs> you know, like there's like a chase scene, but it's like, nobody's going more than 15 miles an hour. It's just like, right. They're on bikes. And charming. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like, There's I, know, I know, I know, who did, I know who did it. So I'm just kind of going through the motions of like watching this little Belgian guy be kind of adorable. Yeah, yeah. No, and also, you know, that that accent. It's a sleepy time accent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's the type of guy you want to talk you to sleep. But um, yeah, so the Wire. Let's talk about it. You're here. You watch the Wire, and uh, from what I remember, this is a recent thing. You just recently completed the Wire. Is that right? Yes, this is a very recent, it was a long overdue development that then developed and is now in the past where I was kind of like the sh the show came out at a time when I, I don't remember exactly why it was that I wasn't watching. I obviously like didn't have HBO, 
Um, sure. But then it but then it started going down just like this is maybe the greatest TV series of all time. And so I had mm-hmm. to, you know, if I'm going to do it, I really want to make sure that I have time to commit to it. And then like I had kids and other things yeah. started happening and it just kind of get getting put off and put off. And so last summer I finally sat down and, um, you know, the family left for a week and I was home alone and I was like, I'm just going to sit down and do the wire, it's wire time to finish. And I'm going to do it. You want him back. Uh, it only took you seven days. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, once they knew that I re- finished the wire, they were like, okay, yeah, we'll come back. Okay. Now we have something <laughs> to talk you were, about. You were, yeah. you were losing us before. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> like, but yeah, I like the so, idea that they left because you were starting because, the wire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, Daddy because needs time watched, alone with McNulty. <laughs> because I hadn't watched. Well, I didn't know that I needed home time alone with McNulty. Um, yeah. But apparently I did. And yeah. so, yeah, I mean, I concur with what everybody always said. But like I had watched, I watched The Shield when it was live. Like I was mm-hmm. watching those as new episodes. Um, and I watched The Sopranos when those were new episodes. And so I kind of, right. and, I, and I was a huge fan of um, Homicide, Life on the Streets. Right? Oh, like I was okay. watching, I was watching those in the nineties when that, that was actually like, you know, if, if you would ask me, what's your favorite drama, like in some like junior high or high school class, I would have been like, oh yeah, Homicide, Life on the Streets is, is the one. So it was always kind of surprising to, even to me that I had never just sat down and knocked it out. But I finally did. Uh, and I have now seen all of the episodes once, one time, nice. except for this episode, which I have now seen two times. Hell yeah. So, so that's, where, that's, that's where I'm at in my wire knowledge. In sixth I grade, you were like, homicide, this is clearly like the most realistic show that's about the right. real streets. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many conversations that. were had, but I wasn't saying, I wasn't saying like, you know, like I'm a, like I'm a slasher flick guy, but like, mm. you know, Adrian, uh, how do you pronounce his last name? Adrian Brano. Um, that sounds right. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a magnetic human being. Oh, he's great. Yeah. Um, Tour de yeah, force. Yeah, no. I do yeah, like the absolutely. idea that in sixth grade you were trying to talk about homicide and other people were like, I like Urkel. Yeah. Uh, Urkel. Because <laughs> he's wow. always, he's eating cheese. Yeah, and, <laughs> give, and, and, give, and giving the cop from Die Hard a bad time. That's right. right. That's right. That guy is I, I, I do, I do, I do, li- I do like to think that that's like in universe and that that guy like re- retired. <laughs> Carl Winslow yeah, they, is they, a they Baltimore Carl, they, <laughs> yeah, they Car- That Carl like kind of like. He's was he away, from, on the away from Die Hard and was like, "I'm gonna go hang out someplace normal like Baltimore." Oh, was he a that. cop on the show? I feel like he was. Yeah, he was a cop. Yeah, he's like the, he was like the, was like the Michael Pena where he always plays a cop. He mm-hmm. just has uh, kind of like cop vibe. He has '90s cop vibes. Yeah, uh, like which was like you know pudgy cop with donut mm-hmm. type. Yeah, of fr- cop. Fr- yeah, friendly, but also like his redemption arc in Die Hard is that he's like willing to kill again. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole thing. Yeah. In Die Hard, he's like, he's like, I don't know if I can be a cop because I won't just blow people away. But at the end of Die Hard, yeah. he blew some guy away. And he's like, you got to get oh, back I'm on the horse. Back, you know, you yeah. got to get yeah. back on I, the my horse. Car- my character arc has been resolved here. I can murder again. <laughs> Great. That is a spinoff. You know what? That's a spinoff I would love to see. And uh, if David Simon, if you're out there mm. listening to this, which I'm sure you are. Yeah. Um, how about a uh, The Wire spinoff starring Carl Winslow? Slash mm-hmm. the Die Hard Cop. Yeah. Um, so you liked The Wire, I assume, when you watched it. I did like The Wire. Yeah, it's very good. Do you do you have a uh, favorite season? Um, th- this third season might be it. Like, might be the one. Just because I also like I, I like Colvin a lot. Like, I think he's oh, also yeah. in that same kind of category. It's just like anytime he's on screen. I, I remember even when he was showing up as like a guest star, probably in like the second season. He was yeah. Just, he was there, but he was just kind of like generic, you know, like brass, uh, right? Like at a, at a crime scene. But you could just like when he showed up, you're just like, I don't know who that guy is, but yeah. I like him. I want and more then, of that guy. Yeah, I want I want more of that guy. And then season three, they were just like, here's a bunch of that guy, kind of just like being the most of that guy that he could possibly <laughs> yeah. be. And yeah. so so yeah, like when I think about it, I think the third season is probably the one um, that honestly gets me the most. Nice. So I was happy nice. to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad to have you on for the third season. Uh, do you have a favorite character? Um, well, I mean, we're, we're at a point right now where we're like, you know, everybody's seen this show. So we're not like pretending sure. people don't know what it is. Right, right. 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 Okay. So I get, I can speak. So it's Bodhi, I think gets me. Oh, um, yes. You know, and Bo- Bodhi is the one who, you know, he comes into it pretty ruthlessly. 
Um, so it's, it is important to remember that Bodie is not like a, none of these people are good people, right? Like this is right. one of the things we always have to remember. Uh, but Bodie is the one who I sort of, my heart goes out to the most. Totally. And when he got, and when he got it, I was like, God, mm, you know, yeah. that one hurt. Yeah. 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 Him, but him, he went him, out, getting cl- him getting clipped was one that was emotional. He went out like a man sure. though. You know, he, did. he stood he, his he, ground on his yep. corner and he died the way he wanted to die. Cause it was bullshit, man. He got sold out by everybody. And he did. You know, he, he played the game exactly the way he was told to play the game and for his troubles was you know, murdered as they, as yeah. they are. Yeah. No, I'm a big Bodie head as well. I think yeah. Bodie is like one of those characters. When you say like, you know, he's not a good guy. It's like, yeah, there's, there are no real good guys, bad guys on the show. There's no one who's like pure of intentions and there's no one who doesn't have dirt on, uh, uh, on their hands. And Bodie was the one I think who most humanized that kind of like the corner boy, like the one who would be easily the like, villain on any other show yeah. just like oh this is bad man but uh he wasn't he yeah, was cause, just because he's, he's, he, he's a henchman you know like yeah he, he never he never really rises above like senior henchman um yeah where he's, he he's likes, in charge he, of the full he's, he's a violence proponent you know he's not yeah. like uh, he's not really conflicted about that part of it but at the same time like he's just so he's just so you know kind of correctly frustrated all the yeah. time mm-hmm. with the way everything is being handled. Um, you know, and even, even in this episode, right. When, uh, when, when Stringer Bell is like, you know, why didn't you, why didn't you find Marlo? And he's like, well, cause you called this meeting, man. Like I'm here for the meeting that you called me to. And he's like, fuck you, get out of here. You know, like, yeah. like, and he, but he's just like, God, man, the only reason I'm here is cause you told me to be here. Um, exactly. So, so him, him kind of harumphing his way around Baltimore, uh, is, is yeah. very good television. Trying to find Marlo so that he can do this cockamamie, cockamamie plan that Stringer has about like, what if we franchise this shit and turn it into McDonald's and less like yeah. a, a drug operation, which Bodie knows not because he took any class, but because he's just been around. He's like, this is not going to work and it's going to end really badly. Not only for is everyone. it not going to work, it's like, it's like asking, uh, you know, it's like asking the writers that are going to be replaced by AI to like go tell the, you know, like to train to meet, the AI yeah, to train the AI, and it's like he, why, why would he like this plan? He's the franchisee, like he's the muscle that that you need on the corner. Why would you? Why would he want a plan that involves less muscle out on the streets? Like that's literally his job. Yeah, yeah, but you know, we cannot get into all of this stuff without first starting the podcast, and we cannot start it without first playing the theme song. Pod. 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 Podcast. Pod. Podcast. The Irish Pod Season 3 All right, ladies and gentlemen and everyone else Today, once again, we're going to be talking about from Season 3 of The Wire Episode 2 All Due Respect Uh, This episode premiered on September 26, 2004. Vince, can you uh, break us off a little piece of that synopsis? I would love to read this official synopsis that Matt definitely didn't write. Yep. Herc details how much gay sex he would have to have in order to have straight sex. Also, other things happen. That's right. That's the episode. And Mm -hmm. thank you, uh, IMDB, for writing it. Uh, But Vince... What was happening at the time that this episode came out? Yeah, that's right, Matt. I think what you're trying to say is that we cannot evaluate uh, culture or can divorce from its cultural... Uh, yeah, excuse me. We cannot evaluate art divorced from its cultural context. Therefore, sure. we have to put some of that context back in with a little something we like to call the back-in-the-day machine. It's a bad time for newspapers. The news hole is shrinking as advertising dollars continue to decline. There ain't no back in the day. Machine tells the tale, son. All right. And today we're going all the way back to September 26, 2004. Uh, some of the things uh, that were happening 
mm-hmm. where Kerry makes Iraq his number one attack. Drop in K- polls. John ag- Kerry? John Kerry. That's right. Drop in mm. polls against Bush leads to change in strategy. Just, I'm going to do more Iraq violence. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. Just a few weeks ago, Senator John Kerry's aides were saying the home stretch of his bid to oust President Bush would focus on the economy, health care, and other domestic issues. Now, almost overnight, Kerry has made Iraq his dominant campaign cause. Day by day last week, his attacks on Bush's handling of Iraq grew more caustic. The invasion of Iraq was a profound diversion from the battle against our greatest enemy, Al-Qaeda, which killed more than 3,000 people on 9-11 and which still plots our destruction today, Kerry said Friday at Temple University in Philadelphia. Not wrong. Not wrong. Sure. (laughs) And there's just no question about it. The president's misjudgment, miscalculation, and mismanagement of the war in Iraq all make the war on terror harder to win. Oh, I'm I'm also, very also excited true. for this this butt that's coming up. <laughs> no, there's no butt. No. no, there's no no there's no there's no butt, man. He's he's you know Kerry's Car- campaign was mm-hmm. about laying into Bush uh, for the Iraq War and everything mm-hmm. that went wrong with it. And and mm-hmm. Kerry was supposed to be beyond reproach on this issue, like because he had this war record, and so he was sure. going to be the only one who was able to like credibly make these um uh credibly make these uh, critiques of Bush. Sure. Uh, but of course, none of that matters because they just swift boated the hell out of him. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, other things. Um, this one is from uh, a British newspaper. Uh, headline: Revenge dot com. How the internet fuels the battle of the exes. Uh, see if you can figure out where this one is going. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yep. This is about the- revenge porn, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Dishing wow. the dirt with a with a strange emphasis. Dishing the dirt on former lovers used to be for celebrities only, but now we're all telling the world via the web. Famous people do it in the press, but the rest of us always had to seek revenge on errant lovers in the courts or by cutting up their clothes. Well, not anymore. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Who wrote this? <laughs> that's, that seems to be really assuming, like, if you're like me and you put your shoes on every morning and then go and, like, declare war on your exes and try to destroy their lives. Um, yeah. that's, it's you know, like, not just for day, celebrities anymore. We didn't have the internet. You know, we had to do it the old-fashioned way. Yeah, I, had to go go door, I had to go door knocking and showing Polaroids to people just to, like, get back at my exes. You know. Look at my whore wife! Yeah, <laughs> be I, like, uh, call the cops, please. I don't identify with the writer of that article. Uh, you know, it's it's written by someone named Katie Guest. Uh, mm. Not anymore. The internet is providing the perfect means for ordinary men and women to strike back at their exes. It just sounds like it's like a startup. This is like a disruption in the (laughs) revenge porn market. Several websites have been set up to exploit the taste for vengeance. The latest of which is the newly launched launched (laughs) myexwifeisabitch.com. Kidding me? Is this me? Oh my god! Uh, demonic, resentful, and spiteful is how one man describes his former partner during a lengthy rant about access oh, to their daughter. Why? Who is named? Thought they were describing the website, but of course, no. They're... Well, it's the website sounds like it's those things. Maybe more than that guy's ex-wife is. A hundred percent more. Most revenge sites are for women. But my ex wife's a bitch.com has been set up for men by Dave Schofield oh, and Brian Sybold great. from Bristol. Great. I went, th- <laughs> I went through a divorce and it ended up costing me over 20,000 pounds, says Mr. Schofield. You end up financially stuffed, and the worst thing is you are forced by law and by an angry ex partner not to see your daughter. So it's oh, only God. fair this that is... I'll get to post nudes of a bobbies. Oh. For a fee of twenty five pounds, members tell their own stories and look for friends in similar positions. Oh, this is now getting this is sad. It's not anti women, the site insists, although many women may disagree. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, it's not okay. It's not wait, excuse me, excuse me. What's the name of the website again? Say the name of the website. (laughs) My ex wife's a bitch dot com. (laughs) It's not anti women. I don't know how you could get that idea. Yeah. I mean, if you are, oh you're taking Lord. the website name out of context here. <laughs> oh my God, this is. Uh, All right, so so it, so we're so we're doing thirty seconds on one of the most consequential presidential elections of our lifetime that was happening right as this episode was dropping, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. we have now done five minutes on my ex wife is a bitch dot com. We that's remember right. the that's, first. That's where we're I at. Feel that's like where we're at. 
Yeah. Listen, the thing about this show is we have to add the cultural context. And I think yeah. this cultural context is much more important. Than it feels like some... a longer time ago than the Bush Kerry <laughs> debate to me in some ways. You mean people paying to do? Yeah, uh, just everything, porn? like all the technology. Or that, yeah, stuff that it would is, be, yeah, that it would be newsworthy that that you could use the internet to get and, back to your exes, <laughs> right? Which, and, yeah. which I'm sure was happening like in on bulletin boards in the 80s. A hundred percent. It was happening on Live Journal a few years earlier. The idea that the that the guys who run my my ex wife's a bitch dot com would be celebrated as disruptors and like uh, savvy uh, technologists uh, in the newspaper, yeah, yeah, it's very good. Yeah. Um, on that note, music sites ask, why buy if you can rent? Uh, today, Sir Richard Branson... they got their answer real fast on that one, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Today, Sir Richard Branson starts a new music store, virgindigital.com, this time selling music as streams of bits to be downloaded from the internet. Virgin, a un unit of the Virgin Group, becomes the first major music retailer to enter the download market, which has been dominated by Apple Computer and other technology companies. Mm. What's interesting is that Virgin is putting its biggest emphasis on its subscription service rather than on selling songs one at a time for 99 cents a track, as Apple and Michael, Microsoft do. Mm. It is betting that new customers will join its Virgin Music Club for seven ninety nine for a $7.99 monthly fee to listen to an unlimited amount of music from Virgin's one million track library. Oh, sure. that's actually... It's, no, this is what it became. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> A That's premium subscription service that will allow those tracks to be moved to a portable music player for a slightly higher monthly f fee will also be introduced. Yeah, huh. look at that. He invented Spotify. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good job. Good for him. Uh, and that has ways. been uh, the back in the day machine. All right. <laughs> All good cultural context. Glad to know that. Spotify it helps me was a glimmer in Richard Branson's eye. People yeah. were making revenge porn, but uh, in a positive way, um, mm -hmm. I guess. And mostly and, ignoring the 2004 uh, presidential election. Yeah. Well, we exactly. also had a, I mean, I can read, tell you about the 32 page contract for the, uh, for the Bush Please don't. debate. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you can't okay. because we got to get into the episode. So uh, this week's Balmer B story um, is, uh, you know, I've got a baby now. And uh, so I only have so much time to make these. Thank you for the applause, mm -hmm. Vince. Um, and uh, so this one is uh, to the tune of a song that I very much enjoy. Uh, and I will play it for you right now. And cheese didn't need to kill his dog. Jimmy Hughesy killed his dog. They blew the fire for a dog. Well, bark, bark. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, yeah, there we go. You can listen to the full version of that song. That's right, Mike. There is a full version of that song uh, at the end of the episode. Uh, all right. This is a great episode. Uh, and I'm very excited to talk to you guys about it because this, for me, um, is the best Herc and Carve episode that we've had so far. Herc and Carve have been kind of skating along in the show so far with these like kind of like little B story bits that have been like funny. Um, but I, I don't know if this beats Fuzzy Dunlop. I, uh, I to me, this is this is miles ahead of Fuzzy Dunlop. Uh, this is the episode in which uh, Herc and Carve are playing a what I would consider like a a game you play as a like a middle schooler with your friends uh and they're doing it as adults and as policemen um well because they're and, as emotionally mature as middle schoolers I, at this point uh, 100. Show. you know Car Car <laughs> carver kind of matures he, he gets to at least like being senior in high school i think yes the show, but yes continue <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it is, uh, it, to me, this is like probably my favorite Herc and Carve episode. Uh, and then there's just also tons of like 
uh, I don't know. There's tons of moments in this episode where I felt like I, I had to do some Googling. Like there was like some research that I was doing. I learned a, about a lot of things. I learned about Gus Triandos. I learned about Mary Tyler Moore saying, uh, oh, Rob. Uh, it was just, uh, I don't know. This was for me, one of my favorites. Vince, what did you think of this episode? Um, I like, I feel like this episode, it sets up, uh, you know, it sets up all the big plot lines from season three, which with Bunny Colvin trying like mm-hmm. his legalization scheme, um, Marlo taking over the corners, uh, Daniels and Rhonda starting to smash. Um, mm-hmm. But I, it's like, but before that, it almost feels like, okay, we got these big plot lines that we're about to set up so we can just have some fun. Um, mm-hmm. And it feels like one of the most theatrical episodes of The Wire, like where they're treading water and they're like, oh, let's just... Let's just go for it. And it's it's one of the silliest episodes. And I feel like it's feels the most like Oz or Deadwood uh, of any wire episode, like before mm. it gets into the, the meat of it, like just the way it's the way it's shot. And uh, and, you know, just like the open, silly, the open silliness and theatricality of it are uh, I, I, I don't think I, I wouldn't want every wire episode to be like this, but I enjoy sure. like that. This one was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause, Mike. Cause, yeah. Because even even the intense like police work that's going on in the show is is usually about a real murder or right. something real that's taking place. Like you know, even if it's a one off thing, you know, the stakes are always very high. And then this one is just like, you know, it's a it. The joke is that she's killed his dog, and <laughs> that's that's it. Wild. Right. That's yeah. what, that's what all of this is kind of revolving around. Like all the no, the normal going through the motions. Like we're listening to the wired. Okay, now we're sending out units. Now we're going to do this. Now we're going to do that. And the whole thing is really premised on a joke. Like there's a punchline at the end of all this mm-hmm. that they're waiting yes. for. Which you know, dog fighting is a terrible thing, and we should sure. be, we should take note of the fact that it's an awful thing that that he did. I'm it's against just, it. it. Yeah, I'm against dog fighting. <laughs> I think and dogs you, should be friends. Should, yeah, people should not yeah, kill their dogs. You shouldn't do that. Right. So, also, yeah. stop Killing, docking the damn pit bull's ears. Like, ugh, I hate dog. Yeah, ears. it's it's all terrible. And so, like, but at the end of the day, it's it's a funny joke, at least in yes. the context of the show, which is not something we usually get and then if you couple that like you were saying with with everything herc and carver are going through like if you counted up the scenes like at least half of this is is mostly revolving around funny stuff yeah yeah which is rare for the wire because i feel like one of the biggest impediments to um a lot of people enjoying the wire or like trying to get into it uh, is it's kind of novel like nature, the way it's kind of like slowly weaving these stories, slowly building the stories up and episodes, um, don't really have this like self-contained thing. So early on, you know, if you were going to get jokes, it was going to be just one storyline. Um, Mm -hmm. and you wouldn't have like a funny episode. It would be a funny moment. This episode, I feel like, um, it does both very well. It it builds up the you know the reason for the season, which is uh, the <laughs> the eventual Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus Thank Christ, yeah. the reason for the season. Yes. Uh, no, the eventual creation of Hamsterdam, the uh, mm-hmm. you know the free trade drug zone, um, while simultaneously uh, showing the uh, major crimes unit uh, fail spectacularly in the funniest fashion possible. Um, in you know, cheese is it is like the, it <laughs> dog is, thing. It, it's like it's li- them living out the ultimate cop dream, which is just that the people you're chasing just randomly lose 40 IQ points overnight and do something right, exactly. really, really stupid. And they're like, well, I don't know, I don't know why he did it. He just decided to confess one day. And, ooh, yeah, it was weird, so amazing. And it's also, uh, the scene with the cheese interrogation, I think is a modern day. Who's on first. <laughs> uh, it's just so funny. And, uh, like credit to method, man, the acting, it, like the comedic chops that he has in the scene are so good. Um, I, yeah, this episode was written and directed by a British guy uh, whose name is Steve Schill, which I don't know what I find funny because me and Matt talk about Schills all the time. We talk about Schills a lot. Uh, but also, like, I, I feel like you can sense the Britishness in it in the way that it is <laughs> yeah, very yes. clearly like fascinated by like Black American uh, vernacular English. Like, it's very. Uh, that's true it, like everything the, is like oh 
they they say dog to refer to people now, don't they? That's yeah, very right. strange. Yeah, let, let, yeah, yeah I, I take that. Yeah, for sure. You, yeah. you hear him say he's talking about the egg around in Poe House, but he's, yeah. we thought he's talking about the poor house. It's very weird. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. It actually is, upon reflection, kind of ridiculous that they confuse dog, D-O-G, with dog, D-A-W-G. <laughs> but uh, I, I have uh, the scene that I, I want to play for you guys. Please lose your dog. Who's your dog? Y'all ain't laying no bodies on me, man. Lawyer time. Oh, he was my dog, man. <laughs> I ain't never gonna find another. Uh, uh. Man, y'all some cold ass motherfuckers, man. <laughs> <laughs> what I thought he punked me, all right? So I did what I had to do. Well, what's done is done. And maybe we can help you on this. How? You gonna bring him back? <laughs> okay. Dog, where's that body? Where I left it, most likely. Warehouse on the east side. And he's still there? As far as I know. Unless the SPCA come around. What? He looks like they broke him. <laughs> I gotta say, you really showed me something on this. I mean, to me, like that scene is perfect, hilarious, and ends with you think like the button is them figuring out that it's uh, a dog, but the button is all of the bosses being like surrounding the box and going like, "Man, we really knocked it out of the park. <laughs> yeah, we, we, <laughs> we did it. We did it, you guys. Popping champagne we, and give each other handshakes, <laughs> busting out the cigars." <laughs> We are such good police. And also just like the subtext that, uh, oh no, he didn't actually confess to a murder. He just confessed to shooting a pit bull in the face. Like in the, yeah. <laughs> like I feel like that's illegal too, no? Yeah. The crazy thing, no, I he's thought a, that no, too. They, he's he's going to get, they were going to ring him up for something because that was, that was like a little sort of like, like a post aperitif joke, which was like, oh, we got him on illegal discharge of a firearm and cruelty to animals, which. Right. Yeah, and I mean, you know, and I it just I get the feeling that that's not a felony from that scene where they're just like, oh man, you know, this is fucked. You know, we 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 don't we don't got him for murder. We just have him for shooting a dog to death. And yeah. there, I'm like, well, you could. There's yeah, got to be. Michael are Vick, there not years involved? Yeah, with Michael that? Vick went to prison for that. Yeah, it's, I don't know, maybe Baltimore. I imagine the Baltimore dogfighting laws, at least at that moment. Yeah, they have a longer history of, uh, you know, anim <laughs> animal fights as sport there. <laughs> My my favorite my favorite bit actually from that whole scene I don't think it wasn't in that clip when he's when they're pressing him they're gonna try to flip him on Prop Joe and yeah he's like, right he's pushing back and he's pushing back and he's like you know what forget it I don't even know Prop Joe like go away from yeah me. like yeah like I, I I do love that little line is like him signaling that like okay we're we're done sort of talking to each other like I'm so done talking yeah. to you that I'm not gonna pretend not to know Prop Joe you know what forget it I don't even know Prop Joe yeah yeah I don't like, even we're, know we're, my we're, uncle yeah I don't I don't know this person who we all know that I know okay <laughs> yeah right no that is true it's like uh of all the people to say that yeah the, his I never heard of no actual, Prop Joe what the hell are you talking yeah about? his like, actual nephew okay <laughs> not gonna be able to sell that one um but yeah was it's not, great be, was not sad when cheese died <laughs> yeah no that was that is like one of the greatest deaths in in the yeah, show where because yeah. i didn't i didn't really see i didn't really see that coming when it came no no one did yeah. it was it was okay. uh, he's you know you're like oh man is this gonna end with cheese on top yeah, Jesus. you know is the cheese really gonna stand alone and i then... love cheese on top sorry <laughs> stupid yeah but it was uh it was very cathartic um it's and, weird that uh, i remember that death much more vividly than bodie's uh yeah that is weird maybe it's maybe just because it was like such don't a, have a shocking heart. scene i don't know yeah no was it's it, almost so, a jump, so you, jump you guys you guys agree that, yeah because it was that like they were they were getting ready to like make this deal oh, we're now on a completely different episode obviously no that's like, fine yeah they were gonna they were gonna make that deal and then instead they just shot him in the back of the head like it was like a joe pesci and goodfellas thing um yeah yeah it was great yeah, really really I, and, great 
Yeah, because like at that point, uh, he had he he was responsible for the death of his uncle. Like he cut a deal with Marlo, and y you were just like, this guy is a total scumbag. Yeah, which and you know, would... go ahead. Oh, and mostly he killed the dog. That was like mostly what I was mad about. Yeah, but prop prop Joe is also obviously high also on prop the list of favorite, obviously favorite characters of, of the yeah. show because he's phenomenal. So good, so good. Um, but you know, I just love dogs. So mm. fucked up, dog. Um, but yeah, uh, no, the the whole beginning of every season uh, of The Wire, you know, so far has been, uh, I mean, the first season, it took five episodes for them to even get a wire going. Uh, and yeah, then at this the point, second they've season, established the pattern that like, it's going to take us three episodes for the season to be about the thing that the season is about. Right. But in this one, uh, they get uh, this. This season starts with a wire already up and running for months and they are just waiting and waiting. Right. To but find... that's not what like the season is about. Right. Right. And yeah. you don't know that up until this point. Yeah. Uh, you are like uh, trying to figure out who their target is. You, you just know that they are failing at this. And then you know that they're, you know, going after Stringer kind of still and they're going after Cheese and to watch the wire be blown in the second episode of the season right. uh, over a dog is uh, is a great joke. It's like a joke by someone who uh, understands what the wire was doing the two previous seasons and going, we're not doing that again. Right. Uh, so I, I particularly love it. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty great. And, uh, leads to McNulty kind of going off on his own. Um, and he has a, just a kind of a small, uh, arc in this episode in which he just, uh, realizes that he's going to be, uh, taking some time out of his own schedule to figure out what happened with D'Angelo. And he solves that murder in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Pretty amazing. Well, actually. he solves what he solves, what happened. He doesn't, like, sure. he doesn't find he, the he culprit. He establishes that it was a murder, not a suicide. Right. Yeah. Well, cause I mean, cause the state cops and you know, they yeah. can't do anything. We know that. And so yeah. I, I uh, you know, it's not it's not implausible that McNulty could come in and and take a look at some things yeah. a second time and not have it just be like some some state guy just like filling oh. out some paperwork because it was a dead prisoner and like probably who cares yeah. they they probably yeah. spent like a hundred percent at it all for sure yeah they don't care and uh, and the only reason that McNulty cares is because he is obsessed with catching Stringer and uh, the kind of like. The game of cat and mouse that they're playing in this season, and you know, once again, we're going to get to this in another episode. But I love the uh, the begrudging respect that uh, McNulty has for Stringer, um, and later on when he just goes to the copy store and thinks that Stringer has turned his life around to become a uh, photocopy <laughs> entrepreneur. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty great. Um, but yeah, yeah all the, that, all the, dr all the, dr all the drug dealing was just about like achieving his dream of right. you know, being a, being a small copy franchisee. Yeah. Of, of managing a mom and pop Kinko. I mean, listen, yeah. yeah, everybody, everybody celebrates anyone who wants to take on Kinko's, which is hundred uh, percent, arguably like the worst franchise, uh, worst chain store of any chain probably famously. Yeah. Yeah. Famously, uh, I, place that is it's actually cornered a very interesting market because i mean nobody really has a high quality home printer mm -hmm. or scanner or copy machine it's it's a last resort place on on so many levels it's where you gotta go and it's like they almost uh on purpose are like you know it's like the dmv it's like you have to be here mm -hmm. it's uh <laughs> they're like airlines <laughs> they can do whatever they want um but uh, let's get into a little bit of what is happening with Marlo, because this is Marlo's, not his first episode. We saw him a little bit uh, last episode, but this is his, I think, um, this is his grand entrance. I mean, to start to begin series. with, he's uh, he's pondering some spinny rims, which were, remember spinny rims? We don't have spinny rims anymore, do we? They were big for a while there. I feel like... 
if we did have spinny rims still, you'd see them more on like the kind of like grind set mindset TikTok people. Mm. You know what I'm talking about? Like the Andrew Tate types, the ones who have like crypto and their like whole vibe is I can't count cash in slow motion and here's my Lambo. I never see those guys with the spinny rims. So I assume that they're not out. Mike I Duncan, have, do you have spinny sorry. rims? I do not have spinny rims. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I yeah, have yeah. the most generic dad SUV one could possibly imagine, and my younger self berates me for it every day. Um, <laughs> do you have a? Life. Do you have a? Super yeah, the guy, the guy like used I to have? go to Kinkos and like steal copies so that he could make band, like band show flyers. And like, yeah, exactly. sit, turn turn it turn in like a doctored little counter thing. Um, even um, clearly walking out with a thousand pieces of paper it's like 13 cents sir <laughs> nobody behind the counter cared yeah, you know? yeah like, it was good. everybody everybody was in on stealing from kinkos so. i honestly yeah. think it's your societal duty to rob places that don't employ enough employees like yeah. you know like like the like the grocery store where they're like oh we're gonna automate everything like it is your duty to ring up mm -hmm. more expensive things as cheap that's things. true to stealing even out from the, yeah to make it more expensive for them to yeah not these, these, bana people. these bananas are a state <laughs> these, yeah. these yeah. bananas are butter. These bananas. Yeah. Are, yeah. No, that is good praxis to steal from any place that has automated their uh, either automated all of their service jobs or um, you know just underemploy everyone who works there. It's good praxis. That's uh, um, that's why I steal from Whole Foods. I haven't seen the spinny rims in a while, but I have seen the opposite seems to have become popular, which is the rims rims that don't move that don't move. That's that's yeah. the new thing. Yeah, rims yeah, yeah, that yeah. Stay same. Yeah, yeah. R rims that stay same. They don't spin even with the car. They just it's like they're on a, a thing and they yeah, so it looks like you're on a slowly. hover yeah, hoverboard yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, those oh, right. uh those I've seen. Rims but, are cool. Uh, That's all I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> rims are cool. But Marlo Stanfield, let's get into him. Marlo uh is running a as far as I can tell, he's running a small crew, like corner crew, um, in West Baltimore. Um and he should be like all the other corner crews at this point um going along with stringer's deal which is like uh you know you keep your corner but you buy from our package mm -hmm. um and uh he's not doing it uh for for whatever reason uh and uh what i enjoy watching is the like uh, the mental gymnastics that stringer is doing in order to make his plan work um <laughs> because Stringer's it's like this, made the classic economics uh, mental gymnastics that you have to do, or you have to like imagine an imaginary world where the uh, where the the hand of the market could function unencumbered. unencumbered. Yes, yeah. No, Stringer's uh, like Stringer is. I think it's either Stringer or Marlow is the weak link in Stringer's plan, and I I, I don't blame Marlow. I blame Stringer because Stringer, like, he wants to do his business without corners. Like, he he wants to do without corners, and because of that, he has less soldiers. Mm -hmm. And without soldiers, he is, like, he's fucked if any of the crews don't go with him because the only way that they can enforce this is through violence. Um, and I feel like the problem with him is that he is viewing himself as a businessman when really he should be viewing himself as a general. Uh, and I, I know we've made fun of like Tony Soprano in the past for being like, you yeah, know, hey, I'm a general, you know, uh, uh, but like that is closer to the truth. The truth is, is you need soldiers because they are loyal and they don't fight for money. They fight yeah, for he's, pride. He's imagining a world that's only carrots with no sticks. But then you can't like show up to a stick fight uh, with a basket of carrots because you're just going to get hit with the stick. Yeah, um, and leave and leave unaccounted for the fact that there will be people who, for their own reasons, like just literally don't want to be under you, right? They yeah, have, right. They have they have their own plans and their own ambitions for themselves that don't involve just being a part of some pyramid that you're building that you can <laughs> right. be part of. And then and they're like, oh yeah, but you can rise up in the ranks of this like Amway operation that I'm trying to set up here. But Marla doesn't want that. And if you don't account for that, then you're yeah, you're not accounting for the world that you're actually living in. Yeah. No. And uh, I feel like that is um, like. Stringer's whole, like, I'm a businessman mindset is, you know, leading to his own downfall. But uh, 
Yeah, let's uh, let's get a little bit of Marlowe. Um, this is introducing uh, Marlowe Stanfield. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. We love when Matt gets editing toys, don't we? <laughs> Sorry. It's good with the visual, I will say. We got some from the terrace. Been being all cute about the property line. Brody, what are you doing? I just wanted to wait and see what you wanted us to do about it. So, well, what you want us to do? Get back to work. Song I still like slaps. To, I'd like to point out that I made that music diegetic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You I, you did some sound editing work, and it did not go unnoticed by me. Okay. I, I will say I wish you'd have gone whole hog and like filmed yourself doing a related stand up bit at the beginning, <laughs> where you're like, "Guy, fellas, don't you hate it when another crew is being all cute with the property line?" <laughs> Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I'm i sure that would have been appreciated. You're trying to uh, sell this your drugs, and this guy's over here dancing <laughs> on the property line. <laughs> Why don't they make the whole property line out of the black box? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, the, the first, I think, Mike, you were saying something about uh, what um, what Bodhi was wearing. Uh, and He's wearing well, a dangly do-rag. Yeah, the way just the way he's just the way yeah. that it, the style of it. Of which yeah, I, that was my I, favorite uh, Looney Tunes character was Dangly Do Rag. But um. so stupid. Uh, no, I realized that uh, um, the Do Rag uh, has never gone out of style. It like started becoming in style around this time, and it just kind of it just kind of stayed. It's, it's yeah. kind of crazy to me. I mean, I don't know that much about fashion, but I do know that I still to this day see, see do rags and, um, you know, I, but the way, the way that Bodhi is particularly styling it at this moment is that, did that enter mm -hmm. into the mainstream in a way? Yeah. I don't, I, you know, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's just kind of hanging there. It does seem, yeah. uh, like uh, he forgot the part with the where, where you tie it up. He's also, but, I mean, uh, he's proving why it's called a do rag and not a talk about it rag because he's out there. Wow, you know, I thought you were gonna say a don't rag. Yeah. yeah, Brent, do we have an ad? Yeah, we have ads for do rags. I thought you were just rolling right into it. Oh yeah, uh, let's take a quick commercial break and do some advertisements. Stick around. We'll be right back. And we're back. Another really stupid thought that occurs to me, uh, like why did they call the company Dude Wipes when Dude Rags was like right there? Oh man, Think you know it. that it's like one of those bits that I was like, ah, oh, it's too bad I took the commercial break so soon because you could have you could have ended it with that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving now, on, now we like a two parter. Yeah. Um, so we see uh, Marlo in the uh, in the rim shop, and it's it, this is the beginning of the rim shop. The guy he's talking to is his, um, you know, his consigliere, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to see him a lot in there uh, planning out various operations. Um, and from that conversation, he realizes that he has to play this in a very specific way where he's like, he knows that Barksdale has muscle, but <clears throat> he also does not want to buy their package. Or be, he doesn't even know what they want is uh, from what I can tell. He just knows that they need to get that the fuck not, away from him. That it's not what he wants. Whatever it is that they yeah. want, it's not what he wants. And it's not what he has in mind for himself. So it doesn't even matter what they're offering because he doesn't now, want it. My question, yeah. like, just, uh, I feel like, isn't, doesn't a consigliere usually have to be of a different race? You know, like, usually, like, Tony, he's going to, uh, Hesh, the Jewish guy, for That's his true. advice. Uh, I think in, like, The Godfather, isn't, uh, Tom Hagen. Yeah, Tom Hagen, the Wasp. Uh, yeah. Like, you need, I feel like you need, like, uh, someone. I don't know, maybe, of maybe a, that guy's originally from East Baltimore. And then, yeah, be, yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, it could be, I know because not to get too deep into the lore, but, uh, you know, uh, Godfather Vito Corleone's original consigliere was, uh, named Abendando, I think. Mm. Um, and so he's Italian. So you're wrong about that. All I right. think you are also specifically thinking of, um, analyze this and how, uh, <laughs> how Billy Crystal was like his console Yeti, but no. Um, yeah. I do not have as an encyclopedic knowledge of, uh, analyze this as you do, Matt. So it's not usually like my first, uh, uh I've thing. seen both analyze this and a analyze that. I know. I know you've never stopped bringing and it up. And I would like to see a third. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> analyze the other. <laughs> analyze this, that, and the other. Uh, analyze and so forth. Um, but yeah, so he decides to um, not look Bodhi in the eye and just kind of swing a golf club around, um, which is a nice implied threat. But uh, you know that he's not going to go for whatever they're selling, and we will see more of that later. Uh, but let's get into Herc and Carve. Um, first question I have for you, uh, both of you, is um, uh, what's your answer to this question? Uh, you can sleep with any anyone in the world uh, as many times, as many girls as you want, but you have to sleep with one guy. Who's it going to be? Tom Hardy. Oh, did I answer that too fast? That was Tom Hardy. Tom yeah, Hardy. Was, I mean, it's good to have an answer. I mean, yeah. I mean, what other good. answer is there? Well, you, you, I mean, what oh, about... Uh, then my answer, uh, French footballer Olivier Giroud. Mm, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, Why? He's, oh, he's a dreamboat. And, I need uh, to look him up. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's he's an incredibly handsome man. And also, uh, he's now the leading goal scorer in uh, French national team history, uh, surpassing Thierry Henry, who could probably also get me into bed without too many... <laughs> drinks <laughs> yeah there's a lot of soccer guys that could get it let's be honest yeah okay, like, yeah soccer soccer mods are good <laughs> okay you guys are missing like the key ingredient of this <laughs> is, is, i don't think i not, i don't think i am <laughs> it is not supposed to be this easy you're supposed to have so many caveats oh, it needs yeah. to be this many women this many times you guys are completely skated over that. Yeah, I don't, yeah. you don't I, like. You don't have to promise me all these like weirdo fantasies. It's just like I'll go to bed with a I'll fuck this guy yeah, for free. Oh, wait, I'm getting something out of this. I thought that was <laughs> no, the, yeah, the exactly. Reward. Well, when I when, when I was younger, uh, you know, speaking of like these games that you play, like uh, so, like back in the '90s, uh, right? There was a Friends episode that had mm -hmm. the the, che the cheat list episode. Mm -hmm. where, like you were, do you, are you familiar with? The yeah. Cheat oh, list? yeah. Oh yeah. Oh okay, yeah. Okay, great. I, I don't know how much. I guess Friends had a huge revival that I never really paid attention to. Um, yeah. But so we so we had a we had a cheat list, but then me and my friends also had a switch list, and you had to actually have five names of mm -hmm. the guy of the basically like if you were a guy and you were straight, it had to be guys, and if you were a woman and you were straight, it had to be women. Just and like if you were gay, it had to be women. Um, right. So just like so, I I've always from the time that I was a teenager, kind of like known who was on my switch list at any given time. So right. when, the, when this comes up, I'm like, yeah, sure, I got I got five, you know, mostly the that, French national <laughs> football team players. <laughs> Mbappe for sure. I think, sure. I think the interesting part about this is that uh, Herc, like he's doing all this to have sex with the Olsen twins. And I, it's got to be, there I was like it maybe, maybe like a two not. year period when, when that wasn't weird. Cause like they went <laughs> from like ooh these are they're going <clears> to <throat> turn 18 soon and there was like a weird creepy uh like thing very, around that very, and then it, it was like maybe 9 months where they like turned into their current form which is just sort of like a a collection of scarves smoking a cigarette right yeah yeah mm, no uh, yeah there was not much of a period in between that when it was it, it, here's the thing being Sexually attracted to the Olsen twins for me has always been um, a very strange thing to admit publicly. Uh, not just because, oh, well, you know, there are these little girls that, you know, we all grew up with, but also because, again, and I've said this many times on this show, the twins' obsession. I don't like it. <laughs> it's gross. It's uh, low key incestuous. I don't know what you want them, why together. Uh, I don't know what you want to do with them. Uh, I think it's you know, the basic math of you, one. You woman might be good, over. You might be two women better. This quite a bit. I think everyone's <laughs> underthinking it. Mike. Yeah, okay. that's true. That's fair. They are related, and that is 
not that's not right for multiple reasons but mm -mm, i don't like it and so uh herc being into the olsen twins and admiring their body of work uh it fits with his character because he does feel like a scumbag. He, he's, yeah, he he is that kind of simple scumbag. It's true. Yeah. Who would like? Who's the kind? He's the kind of guy who like knew exactly how old they were when they were yeah. seventeen years old. Right. Yeah. He's the guy who had the countdown clock to yeah. when they turn eighteen. Yeah. And, and he's like the like the, you know fast forward seven years. He's the reason Pornhub has all those step sibling categories. Honestly, I blame Herc as well. I don't know. It's another thing. I don't need that. It's a little more forgivable. <laughs> than twins but uh yeah no uh who would i i it's yeah, well, yeah you're, I did, you've 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 really not answered this question yet i, I don't have my answer well. ready yet but um i mean it'd have to be i think it'd be pete davidson <laughs> okay because mm -hmm. i just have to know i have mm, to know sure what because how you know what i mean how how is it and and the trade-off is that guy. I it's, get to well, sleep. I, yeah, I, mean, I get to sleep with every woman that he slept with, and in return, I sleep with him. That's how it works. Yeah. So, you know, I think but it's I stupid. just I th he's I th he's he's funny, right? Yeah. So that and that's always plays. And I think you know he's got the BDE for a reason, probably. Yeah, I think he definitely is. Uh, I mean, I I he's got to have like three dicks. Because how is it possible? I think he has, I think he has multiples, and we just don't know. I think it's very simple. I, like I interviewed him like before, like all the Kim Kardashian stuff, like I don't know, five or six years ago, and I mm -hmm. sort of came away thinking like, oh man, he gave me such great quotes that he probably didn't give to anyone else. Like he gave me that like, ooh, I feel special because uh, oh, he gave me all these good go. quotes, okay. and I feel like that's like just a very basic uh, <laughs> quality that people, you know, that people prize. Yeah, no, you could be right, but I think there's something make, going make, on there. Make, make, making making them feel like they're the only you're you're the only person in the world. Yeah, I'm special. He Bill, talked Bill, to me like Bill, I'm yeah, special. Yeah, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton has that too. Oh, 100 percent. That's what everybody. Yeah. That's what everybody always says about Bill Clinton, which you know. Yeah, we know where he I is mean, on that's, the scumbag scale. A hundred percent, and that's the thing is, uh, I think you know you need to. Uh, Take a little bad with the good in terms of Pete Davidson. I'm sure he is an egomaniac, um, but I would want to know uh, what that dick do. So we've all answered the question, but let's mm -hmm. see what Herc and Carve uh, have to say about it. One act, one time. Right. And the minute I name a guy, you're going to be like, I knew you were cocksucker from the first time I laid eyes on you. Steve McQueen, huh? That's your fantasy? You fucking closet case motherfucker. Steve McQueen? <laughs> Fuck you. It's a setup. <laughs> Both Olsen twins. Ashley. Kate. Mary Kate. And yeah, I mind their body of work. They're yours. All you gotta do is name a guy. I'm not catching them, pitch. No problem. So what I find interesting about this whole sequence is that um Herc knows it's a setup from the jump he knows this game and i think everyone does when you're a kid you play this game with your friends and it doesn't matter how many like you know women you put at the top of the list as soon as you name a guy you're completely fucked uh everyone's gonna make fun of you and you know hopefully nowadays people are a little bit uh less openly homophobic on the schoolyard but i have a feeling that that's uh this kind of feels case. like it comes from like the entourage school of script writing like this is kind of how entourage characters talk to each other we're like oh that's weird like stop being weird and i'm right. and i've always been like <clears throat> you have you had weird friends that uh that i don't know like you couldn't actually get any sort of vulnerability with oh or god like, yes uh, yeah like, or, i, feel I like mean the weird the weird thing about this, like looking back on it, is like the mental gymnastics that they have to go through to like set it up for he, him <laughs> to walk into this quote unquote trap yeah. that right. has now been set for him. I mean, it has been yeah, Olivier Giroux, if you're out there, like I'm not looking for anything in return here. Just, just a, <laughs> yeah. I like the payoff. Just a like, a, like a nice, di like I assume he's going to buy me a nice dinner. <laughs> I, uh, I would hope so. Yeah. yeah. I like the payoff. And Matt, I think you have some trivia about uh, how where this goes yes. and how we got there. 
so um yeah i have uh so let's let's get his answer as to uh who he would choose triandos who's gus triandos he's a catcher with the orioles back in the day i mean my brother had his card Sorry looking motherfucker, man. I mean, you look like this little kid who got left at a bus station by by his parents. And I found the card. That is that is the exact card that he is talking about. And he does look sad. That was that what per peak performance looked like in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That I mean, that is yeah, a, a like man's just man. Chain, cha chain smoking like a true athlete does. You know, <laughs> looks it looks like 70 at the age of 30. Right, exactly. Oh, that is a 23-year-old man. Bald, bald. Yeah, exactly. 23-year-old man. There he is. Probably spends yeah. a lot of time Looks like he's been through four parties. wars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's hilarious that he chose a catcher because he specifically said, I'm pitching, not catching. Uh, yeah. So he, he really wanted to make that clear by choosing a catcher. But he chose a very obscure baseball player and... Uh, Apparently, after Gus Triandos died, um, David Simon wrote a, a little story about this particular choice uh, on his website, davidsimon.com. And uh, Vince, I have that for you. Oh, you want me to read that? Okay. Oh, yeah, if you want. The tale, this is written by David Simon, so, like, yeah. and you can tell. The tale begins with Richard Price, the noted novelist and screenwriter who is kind enough to grace the wire with some of his script work for four seasons of the HBO drama. Price is famed for the verisimilitude of his urban patois and his detailed characterization, but he doesn't get enough credit, in my opinion, for his comedic chops. Looking to bring in a little of that in a particular episode, we decided to lay a secondary storyline on him in which Herc and Carver engage in that essential debate of fractured masculinity. You can screw any three women in the world if you have sex with a man of your own choosing first. When the script came in, Price had gone us one further, offering up comedy gold. Not only had he accessed the essential lust and homophobia of our characters, but he had combined it with yet another straight male elemental, sports trivia. Price had gone deep into his 1950s era baseball card collection and picked out the slow, lumbering Baltimore Oriole catcher of the late 1950s. He was well enough known, in Baltimore at least, that the reference would knock Orioles fans on their asses with laughter, but not so well known that the humor inherent in the obscurity of Herc's choice wouldn't play. And more, Herc catching a blowjob from Gus Triandos is a funny thought. The choice itself implies a wonderful overthinking of the problem. After the script was circulated and the entire writing staff gathered itself from the bout of collective laughter, I was suddenly filled with a sharp pang of guilty horror. Was Triando still alive? Why not? He'd only be in his early 70s, I calculated. Christ. I mean, I know the guy is, legally, some sort of public figure as an ex-professional ball player. But how do you throw this joke up on national television without his say-so? Do what? Price asked. We have a number for Triandos. He lives out in California. You're going to call him? What choice do I have? Oh, shit. Never mind. I'll think of something else. No, Triandos is perfect for this. Inspired, even. But Richard, when you speak of me in the days to come, remember what I did for you here and speak well. I like that he didn't. He was like, never mind. If you're going to call him and tell him about it, we'll just choose a different Natural guy. Natural reaction, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is hard to describe how fast I was speaking when I got on the phone with Gus Triandos trying desperately to turn the corner with the old fella to make him see that the joke wasn't really on him, but on this character named Herc, this big lumbering narcotics cop in Baltimore. No, no, he wasn't saying that you had sex with him. No, no way. And he's not even saying that you would want to have sex with him. It's not about you, really, trust me. I'm not sure I understand, Trando said. Okay, let me send you the pages. I'm going to send all the pages for this storyline, and if you see what the joke is and you are okay with it, then great. And if not, we won't use your name. Just look at the pages, okay? This is a television show? Really? <laughs> Christ. I sent the pages off with little hope, other than that Gus Triando said he would get together with his sons and they would read them and he would eventually get this back to me. This is phenomenal. Naturally, I imagined <laughs> he would story. pick... Oh, yeah, I know. Who, he, naturally, I imagined he would pick up the phone to call me and everyone with anything to do with this television show, a pack of free-range assholes. But four days later, my cell phone rang and Triandos was on the line. I get it. It's pretty funny. You get it? <laughs> yeah, he Great. feels sorry for me because I had to catch Wilhelm. Exactly. <laughs> hey, I feel sorry for me. Catching Wilhelm was miserable, he laughed. Go ahead. It's not like you're making me out to be gay or nothing. It's just a joke. 
I never had a chance to speak to Mr. Triandos after that to hear how that episode actually landed on him. But I like to imagine him enjoying the joke and the improbable cultural reference for years to come. Incredible. So I have a theory like about this whole story, which is again That's fantastic a fantastic story. story. Yeah, um, great story. like I I feel like the ultimate writer thing is like picking like there's there's no more writer way of remembering some guys than remembering a knuckleballer. Like writers are mm. all obsessed with knuckleballers. Uh, Tin Cup, the entire origin story for Tin Cup's nickname is that he was a catcher for a knuckleballer. Uh, hmm. If you've sure, ever I was, read, I was, I was brief. I was briefly in a band called the R.A. Dickies. There you go. Yeah. Uh, there's. I don't know who that is. I assume he's a knuckleballer. He's a knuckleballer. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, the uh, one of the greatest baseball books ever written uh, is called Ball Four. It's uh, by Jim Bouton, who was like a '60s pitcher who sort of had a whole second act to his career by learning how to throw a knuckleball. He's also the guy who invented big league chew with, Oh, uh, right. Along with the director of tar somehow. Right. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I feel like the thing, the ultimate let's remember a guy is let's remember a knuckleballer. Well, I, yeah. lo- I, I love that. Probably the reason why Trandos ultimately decided that this was fine is that whoever wrote it, was a like what it wasn't just like they pulled a name out of a hat, right? This is clearly right. somebody who knows enough about baseball that they can intelligently put in a line about him being a catcher who suffered while catching Hoyt Wilhelm, which was a hundred percent true. It wasn't just we're writers and we need a baseball player to fit into this thing. It was, you know, he read it and understood that it was coming from somebody who knew his career and appreciated his career. And so he was cool with it. Yeah, I appreciated it's, his just, it's, it's, and it's about it's about being desirable also. Right. Yeah, sure. You're ultimately saying you're a desirable person. Yeah. I, I also, of all the men in the world. Yeah. You know, Herc, Herc shows which, him. Yeah. I yeah. also think. Congratula- congratulations. Congrats, Gus. You, you got this big <laughs> wad of narcotics officer who just really. Who, who will you know, allow you to go down on him. Yeah. yeah. So he can get with the Because he feels twins. sorry oh, for you. Because he feels sorry for you. Yeah. I also, I feel like, th- <clears> like <throat> this is just perfect for the way writers always write sports, which is like every sports movie, uh, like the, the screenwriter imagines the way to be good at sports is just like finding the right metaphor. Like they, as soon as the coach figures out how to like, uh, imbue his players with like the correct metaphor to think of, like that's how they become like, so the knuckleballer is like the ultimate writer's fantasy of an athlete because it's like the ultimate example of a guy who's succeeding not through like sheer athletic ability or uh you know fast twitch muscles it's like oh he's doing it through being clever and being sneaky and having a lot of yeah guile. Th- that's i i think that that's ultimately where all of this comes down to is that a knuckleballer isn't really an athlete in the way that we think of an athlete as an athlete like we all imagine that if things had gone a little bit differently like we could succeed as knuckleballers yeah <laughs> if only i was clever way. enough yeah, yeah. Yeah, or if I could just grip it just right, Mm -hmm. then I, too, could be a major league player because I can't do anything else on a baseball field at at even a high school level. But Yeah, right. But standing there throwing a knuckleball? Yeah. I could do that. Yeah, Yeah, how hard could it be? Really slow that doesn't move? And it's, of course, a team. You'd have to also be good at throwing the other ones, which would be my biggest issue. No, I mean, like, the the Necros of the world, like, they, they were almost exclusively knuckleballs you know you didn't even have to mm. slip a fastball in that often because the pitch itself was so yeah uh, it's so its own changeup. yeah <laughs> i did one time go to youtube to see if i could find a compilation of the uh slowest pitches ever and uh that was a lot of fun to watch <laughs> ever yeah. ever seen a yeah, pitcher the, throw the, 50 miles an hour it's great I love yeah it wakefield didn't even like take a wind up. He kind of just like stood there and just tossed it in there. Yeah, and, n- and not not it. counting this uh, this new thing of, of of position players pitching all the time who just kind of lob it up there. But actual yeah. pitchers throwing yeah. lob balls is great fun because we can all imagine ourselves doing it. Yeah, yeah. It's the uh, you know it's the character in the Marvel movie who's you know is like supposed to be the surrogate for the audience. That's me. I could do that. The the knuckleballer is the everyman of the baseball world. Hundred percent. Yep. Um, but yeah, uh, Herc, of course, uh, decides Gus Triandos and um, great answer. He, uh, 
Great answer, uh, but of, unfortunately, he pays for it. Four big guys, and they bust on my eyes. <laughs> they eat my ass just like apple pie. If they right. keep there we go. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just Listen, if I make the clip, I'm going to play it. That's time it's, is taken out of my day. Yeah, they're not the most enlightened bunch of dudes I've ever come across in my life. <laughs> no, no. Which is why they're great as cops. Uh, yeah. And uh, we all enjoy that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Herc and Carve uh, also um, have a great scene um, with Poot and Bodie in which they run into them at the movie theater. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And to me, that was like... Have you guys ever run into your teacher in public outside of school? Do you guys remember that feeling of seeing yeah. a teacher IRL sure. and, and being like, oh, shit. Ew, like, you have a life? Gross. You yeah. go to the movies? I remember the weirdest thing was like seeing them uh, with like a significant other because, I mean, I don't know what the teachers you had, but uh, LAUSD teachers, they're not the most attractive bunch. You know, and so I uh, all I could think about was like, Mr. Bailey fucks. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't like that one bit. Yeah, um, I but didn't like thinking about Herc fucking anybody. Oh, God. I, I think we all are against that. Yeah. Uh, it's a very disgusting thought. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I enjoyed that, especially since like in a way it mirrors that kind of like universal you know, oh, I ran into my teacher at the, you know, fucking hobby shop or whatever, uh, because it's not a teacher. It's a guy who literally abuses you physically. Every yeah, it's, it's like running into the it's, it's like running into the vice principal specifically, like of all, yeah. of, the, of all of the kind of like people from our childhoods. Right. <laughs> the person yeah. who's in charge of like discipline, who's just mean and getting in. You're like. You go to the first wives club? Like, why do you... That's... Mm, man, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> yeah, the idea that, like, you know, these people would ever be off the clock from, you know, f kicking kicking the ass of a child standing on a corner selling drugs is, uh, you know, it's probably strange to them. And, of course, the other way around, too. You know, they're, like, you know, uh, weird that uh, these drug dealers are off the clock right now. But uh, yeah, that was that was a lot of fun. Um, but to get into uh, some of what's going on with Bunny and what we're setting up here, um, it, one of the greatest moments I think in the scene, in terms of like not played for laughs, but just played for um, well, it's just good acting, is uh, the Bunny Colvin paper bag speech. Um, I. I thought that was uh, I was like a brilliant analogy and also uh, there's something about this whole Hamsterdam idea that I'm uh, I'm like yeah we, we should do that mm -hmm. yeah well we kind of are mm hmm I yeah. mean in 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 different aspects I mean definitely there is uh, there are I mean living in San Francisco there were certain areas of the tenderloin that I was like okay this is Hamsterdam this is yeah. kind of like the free trade zone the cops don't really bother people um as long as they keep it in this uh in this area yeah, um, seattle, seattle and portland both kind of have that kind of have an yeah. amsterdam vibe going right now yeah and i but i think what is uh sort of the i mean the incredible thing about it is uh whereas the paper bag was is something that to this day is still kind of um i mean it's it's still considered a good civic compromise people still will put a paper bag around it especially you know uh in the hood you put a paper bag around your your alcoholic beverage no one's gonna really bother you for it um with drugs we just still as a society are not there yet uh they will find any reason to uh take any of these like you know, free selling, free using zones and uh, bust them up in order to uh, to get some good stats out of it, which is uh, which is very sad. But uh, yeah, I have a I have a, a clip of that in 50s and 60s. There was a small moment of goddamn genius by some nameless smoke cow who comes out to cut rate one day and on his way to the corner, he slips that just bought pint of elderberry into a paper bag. 
a great moment of civic compromise. That small, wrinkle-ass paper bag allowed the corner boys to have their drink in peace, and it gave us permission to go and do police work. There's never been a paper bag for drugs. Until now. Mm. Mm. He doesn't really address how you're going to cover a crack pipe with a paper bag and still be able to smoke and light it. It's a metaphor. I think it's, I think it's a metaphor, I bro. I think it's, I think it's I, a metaphor. You know I how know. in with art, <laughs> And sometimes I have to explain art to Vince. <laughs> sometimes art, you say things. Yes, yes. go on. Uh, you Wasn't say the bag light on fire? <laughs> yeah, so it's not actually how it would be, but it's like you say things and you and you yeah. say, oh, but it's similar. Yeah. Mm. Did I explain could, art it, good just then? Oh, like yeah, there might be similar? It might be a simile, right? But okay. It, yeah, yeah. Before, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, it's uh, art. They're doing an art. But uh, yeah, no, I <laughs> like, I... I'm very excited for this coming season because the hamster yeah. dam hamster dam arc is I think one of the most brilliant arcs in, in the whole series because it kind of shows that kind of experiment that you do see, uh, you know, in big cities, especially across the country. Um, and you, <clears throat> you see its entire life cycle. Um, and it, uh, it gets into the reason why, at the end of the day, it doesn't work. And uh, and who is fighting the war on drugs? Like, why do we keep doing this over and over? Why are we all Herc? Uh, knowing we're in a trap, knowing no matter what we do, we can pick Gus Triandos, we can pick every Olsen twin and uh, Olsen sibling, and we're still gonna end up with the, in the same place. Like, how do we break that cycle? And uh, Bunny decides, he doesn't. He's not going to play that game. He's he's uh, and, he's not going to fuck Gus Triandos. He's not going to suck off Taylor Hanson to fuck all the Spice Girls. In terms of like bringing context, like the his, the context into this, like this is coming out in two thousand four. Like this is before it was really even like appropriate to be like people shouldn't be busted for weed anymore, mm -hmm. right? Where, like that was the conversation that was still being had at the time, where it was like third rail politics to be like, I don't think that we should have people in jail just because they have like an eighth of weed on them. Um, yeah. And so, so for all of us who were, who were growing up, you who just wanted to like get high, um, you know, you, you sort of become, you sort of have this like libertarian mentality about drug use totally. because, it, because it includes all the drugs of your choice as well. And, but, but we, this is, this is being dropped into a society that can't even get over pot yet. Um, right. And and so we're now we're coming up on, you know, we're 20 years beyond. We've already done the 20th anniversary, right, of The Wire yeah. debuting for sure. Um so yeah, we're we're 20 years on from that. And yeah, we've sort of cleared weed off the deck. Um <laughs> but there there are still, you know, as until we start treating drugs and drug addiction like the social problem that it is and not the mm -hmm. law enforcement criminal uh thing that it is, then yeah, we're never going to break this and you can't just do what this is, which we're seeing happen on the West Coast, was let's just kind of legalize drug use, but not have any of the other sort of support right. services that are necessary yeah. to like right. have, have, have a... people maybe <laughs> temporarily cycle through this, but then get out of it, and instead just creating these like permanent communities where people are um, mm -hmm. doing horrible things to themselves and to other people. Yeah, uh, if right. you don't have and the resources, if you don't have the resources to treat the addiction, like all of the other stuff is kind of, uh, yeah, you know, just yeah. it's just like a matter of uh, politeness or not, you know. And it's also short sighted because you all it does is it just uh, it just creates a new cycle within this like broken framework where it's like, OK, you know, uh, this is going to last for a little bit until this area becomes an eyesore for the uh, the new gentrifiers and the new developments that are going to go around. And then there's going to be a political outcry and then there's going to be a tough on crime mayor who's elected and so on and so forth. And it just uh you know, it's it's showing that the war on drugs oftentimes is uh, perpetuated by uh, people's campaign managers, essentially. I mean, this whole 
uh, this, you know, the this whole hamster dam idea is born out of in this in this uh, season is born out of the fact that the mayor picks an arbitrary number of murders that need to go down, uh, and Bunny Colvin is like, "How the fuck do you make a murder go away?" Uh, and uh, he decides to do hamster dam because it will create less violence in his district, and it's like. The only reason that the mayor wants this is because Carchetti is getting on, on his ass about crime because he has ambitions. So it's like, yeah. how much of the war on drugs is driven by the ambitions of politicians? And it's a, it's a good amount. Yeah, and then they're going to realize that like, oh, I guess the citizenry would rather have invisible murders than like a giant... Uh, eyesore of uh, like a drug free zone and they really right. yeah and if, they, if you listen to certain elements in San Francisco it definitely seems like they hundred percent have more invisible murders and less visible petty crime it's what it's what suburbia yeah. chooses every time like nine times out of ten I mean because it's two yeah. shitty choices like you're not giving anyone a good choice right yeah and it's funny like watching it in san francisco because it is like the most like purported like <laughs> the oh we are the most liberal city in the world and watching these guys turn into like techno fascists and like basically turn into uh you know the so screaming suburban housewives of the 50s you know they're all just and they're doing it with a kind of a liberal tinge you know and uh you're just like what you're saying is you don't want to see uh any of these people you don't care if they get help you don't care about anything you just don't want them in your line of sight and uh and yeah they're um they're very liberal <laughs> and also them kicking out, uh, like recalling Chesa Boudin was like one of those moments where I was just like, okay, San Francisco is officially, officially done. Uh, it's just, uh, there's no hope for it anymore because it was uh, just, uh, you know, I, I had some hope when we got uh, Chesa Boudin, but then uh, it all went to shit, didn't it? Because it's full of techno fascists who would rather That's all right. of these... You know, gross people just go away. Why can't we just mm -hmm. put the gross people somewhere else? Why can't they go and yeah. them more? Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's but not yeah, I to mean, be like that here in San Francisco. Yeah, and you know, you talk about like kind of um, how we are. You know, twenty years on, at least we're, you know legalizing weed and it's like the, but it's still federally well you're uh, also like you're trying to make they're trying to make it like the liberal position is to just like not notice uh mm -hmm. homelessness as a problem right. it's like oh no this is fine actually i like right right i exactly. like walking past uh tent, oh. <laughs> tent cities and it's yeah. like well no you actually need some uh, no that's that's the thing things because to you, change can't, it. you can't do any of these things you can't in change anything structurally right? you, yeah. have, you have to do the whole thing yeah um, right and address these so, social questions. So we are in the Herc framework. We are still in this framework where we 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 have not decided to abandon it completely. We are still in this trap where we are like one side is like, oh, I'm gonna pick all of these women and they're gonna be so hot, all of the spice girls, every single girl group from the nineties. And, you know, then you have to, I'm going to take everything back to, uh, her fucking Gus Triandos and you guys just have to accept that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like the, the framework in and of, in and of itself is fucked. Uh, and because there isn't really outside of, you know, the internet, uh, like a dead, like a real push to just legalize drugs, blanket legalization. Uh, the only place you can land is uh, I don't want to see homeless people kick them all out or um, oh no I love homeless people seeing them is fine <laughs> and it's like yeah. and housing them you know uh, and, and just it's like all of these things that we do except for legalized drugs and uh, that's why the show is timeless I think you know because uh, it's like timeless in the saddest possible way <laughs> yeah, cer yeah certain certainly when I watched The Wire I was not like, wow, this sure is of a time, you know, like, wow, what a, t <laughs> yeah. what a time capsule to like another place. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Whereas like if I was to watch, say like, you know, I haven't watched it in a while now, but like, you know, I watched some West Wing uh, a yeah. couple of years ago yes. and that is just like, this is a time capsule. Of, yes. Like, yeah. we're, we're like, we're like four epochs beyond yeah. like where this show was when it was coming out. 
Um, yes. But yeah, no, you don't you don't get the feeling about the wire that like what was oh the, gosh, I don't understand this the past yeah. is a foreign country, you know, like <laughs> what, none, of, the, none of that is happening with the wire. What was no. the what was real. the Sorkin show like Newsnight or whatever or Newsroom. News, newsroom. Mm, newsroom. Like that yeah. was a time capsule when it was released. Like it was Yeah. It was yeah, yeah. it was a, immediately dated itself like yeah right yeah. out the shoot but i i do think that the wire will ultimately be timeless even even if like in a hundred years maybe in a hundred years or 200 years we'll get there but it's you know larger critiques of you know governing structures and and the incentives of politics mm-hmm. and you know how you know that you know the the cops and the gangs are basically just the same thing except one of them has a badge and the others don't like all of that stuff i think I think a lot of like what is in this show would be recognizable like to Romans. You know, if, if we brought oh, yeah. some Romans, if we brought some Romans forward and said, you know, watch some shows, they'd be like, yeah, we basically get this one. You know, there's <laughs> there's some guys that are trying to make money doing doing things that are forbidden by the officials and their officials who are corrupt. Like all of this is recognizable yeah. human behavior. Um, yeah. Unlike West Wing, which upon which is yeah, does exactly. not really resemble normal human behavior like at all. <laughs> if, if, if any show was written by a liberal uh, yeah. AI bot, it is. Yeah, it is it's just that pure, show. pure fantasy land stuff. Um, oh, it's so great. Is, is really Did they do 9-11? Did that happen in West in the West Wing? Who, the, the the West Wing didn't do. Ni- oh no! I, 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 I meant like who did? The, like Aaron Sorkin didn't do nine eleven. Um, but it didn't was, you know? Uh, it was it was Bush and Cheney. That yeah. yeah. Uh, no, they they did a they did actually the the first um, sort of a, uh, uh, like chip on West Wing's reputation was right after nine eleven. They did a they did an episode called I think Isaac and Ishmael. Um, mm-hmm. that, that nobody ever wants to talk about ever again. It was like a one-off thing where they had to go into the basement of the White House because there was like a terror threat. But they never, uh-huh. they never explicitly called it 9/11, right? They never mm-hmm. actually covered 9/11. But they like go into a basement and it's like it was the most like sort of like cringy, noxious like de- <laughs> debate about political. Uh, it's it's it was just it's so painful to watch. It, uh, it's even, their nine eleven episode is them hiding out. Yeah, yeah, in the basement. Um, because Did they had you to see... go down there, and they were like, there was it, it was like a student group. So they were so he was like <laughs> leading this discussion with the students on like why do Muslims hate Jews? And you're just like, oh, God, God, this is oh God to watch. And it was at the time. It was it was I was absolutely panned at the time um, for being totally tone deaf. Did you see it's the amazing. newsroom episode? I think they were fi- they're on the plane <laughs> and oh, they're yeah, finding yeah. out. Oh, th- th- this, yeah, that's they're finding out that I think, sharks jumping each other at the same yeah, time. I feel like they. I, th- I think it was like when they found out that Osama bin Laden had yes. been killed and yeah, that, had been killed, and, yeah. and everybody's fighting on the plane, and then the pilot comes out, and there's like a close up on his pilot's badge, and everybody yeah. calms down because like that is Aaron Sorkin's uh, central casual, ideology ca- is that casual, he's a casual uniform. misogyny. <laughs> well, that too, and he's just a uniform worshiper. We've said on the, yeah. our podcast before that in the rough draft of every Aaron Sorkin script, the woman is just named my ex-wife. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, because that that whole that whole scene is about how this flight attendant is right, um, mm-hmm. but and every one of the main characters is is wrong and acting in a t- totally reprehensible way. And then yeah. it's not until the captive dad comes out, and mm-hmm. then it's like, oh well, hysterical mom, why don't you go off to one side, and I yeah. will accept the uh, stop being a know, woman. Congratulations! Yeah. So I wanted to be the first yeah. to tell you we we got him for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That, Shit's just they all salute. We heroically murked a guy in his porn dungeon. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> oh, I I found a I have a, a clip of that scene. Hold on. Four big guys <laughs> and they bust on my eyes. They eat my ass just like apple pie. Oh, if they keep fucking me like this, I might just die. They pipe my booties till I cry. He licked my dick in the cum. That guy gets shot oh. like two minutes later. So that's know. true. He does. Mm, less, yeah, hopefully, yeah. he learned a lesson there that he should stop being so homophobic and he should think about uh-huh. who he would sleep with. Yeah, you know, because that's actually, exactly. he's got an answer too. And maybe if we if we all start thinking about who yeah. we're not immediately sexually attracted to we would be willing to have sex with that we could yeah. maybe then figure out the drug problem yeah someone Absolutely. really did bust on his we eyes gotta think, it was we gotta way think different. holistically here I, I completely agree I like that we uh, played the game very progressively where we just just went with here's the guy and I don't need any of the girls because you yeah, know I, yeah, I don't... ally yeah yeah. I'm a, also, I'm an open-minded you know, dude who's hot for various French footballers. 100%. And mm-hmm. Tom Hardy, I completely agree. 
Sure. Tom Hardy is just like, there's something, I feel like uh, I would fuck him just to like hang out with him and talk to him about stuff. Cause I feel like he has a really like nice voice. Like, uh, you know, I just feel like we would, you know, he could just read to me. Well, that's the episode. Um, <laughs> is there anything that I missed? Uh, a favorite scene, a least favorite scene, or something else you guys want to talk about? Vince? Um, I love the scene where uh, Bunk and McNulty are in the bar and uh, and they have like, they have like they a series. They run a play. They run a play. And, uh, and the play is to purposely gross out a woman so that yeah. your friend can come in and be the lesser of two evils. And I'm like, yeah, that's, you know, not bad. I like what he did there. Yeah. Very few yeah, redeeming does... characters on this show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, again, no good guys. Uh, it's just a lot of gray. A, a least, lot of gray least favorite. Sorry, are we doing both at the same time? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, least favorite I could have done without the Poe house. Like, that feels very, like, uh, a white dude fascinated by uh, Black English wrote that scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, for sure. and like, if they were gonna do it, they could. They like fully explained the joke. Like he he said it twice. Like we kind of got it the first time, and then the, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I, I I what was interesting I thought about that was that it is funny that white people would go into the hood in Baltimore looking for Edgar Allan Poe's house and uh, just assume that anyone that you ask on the street would be like, oh yeah, I am I am familiar with Edgar Allan Poe's house. Let me just give you a grand tour. Like it is a very funny thing to uh, to ask a stranger on the street. Um, yeah. Uh, Mike, do you have a, a favorite scene, a least favorite scene or something else that we missed? Oh, well, I mean, I, I hit plus 15 on the dog fighting because uh, I don't need that in my life, right? I just kind of skip through that. Yeah. I don't actually need that shown to me. Um, so I would say that's what was my least favorite part. But the, I mean, the best part of this is this is Bunny, you know, coming out and sort of announcing yeah. what and like w watching the show again. You know, this is the f literally the only episode I've rewatched um, is, you know, I didn't know exactly at the time what this season was ultimate was going to turn into. And so knowing now what it's what is coming like that little moment of like this is setting up what's probably your favorite season of The Wire because it's the most sort of like crazily ambitious because there's yeah. no there's no crazy ambition like a guy who's you know three months from retirement and they can't do anything about what he's about to do like that's yeah. when crazy ambition gets fun and he's yeah. about to do something really you know he's gonna he's taking a big swing here and I love it yeah I love a good big swing and I love Robert Wisdom just another guy who um there's like a you know there's some guys who I just like they go on a list of like uh, daddy hold me and he's just one of those guys who like if he just held me I would feel safe in his arms sure. you know what I mean yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That, he's yeah. Gonna, he's gonna wind up doing that he's, he saves the one of them right I think the only yeah. one who ever got out uh, is because of Colton. that's that's right yeah daddy you know him. maybe maybe I'm right about that maybe I should hit up Robert Wisdom see if he'll save me um if I had to give this episode a letter grade and I do um I'd give it a B plus. Vince, what would you give this episode if you had to give it a Yeah, very grade? tough choice. I mean, I think I'm definitely gonna give this an honest solid B plus this oh, time. Oh yeah. Mm, it's okay. Uh, no. Like I said, it's a silly episode. Um, and I wouldn't want every episode to be like this, but uh, you know, this one I enjoyed. Yeah. All right. Uh Mike Duncan, what would you give this episode if you had to give it a letter grade? I think I would give it uh well, it's not quite an A and it's not it's not as bad. It's not a B. So I would say B plus as well. Okay. B plus. All right. Big shocker here on pod yourself, the wire. That is a solid B plus episode of the wire and a solid a plus episode of pod yourself, the wire, Mike Duncan. Thank you so much for coming on and talking about the wire with us. Thanks for having me guys. Where can people find you? Uh, it's getting a little dicey out there on social media. Cause I used to be able to say like, you can find me on Twitter, but like, I'm not really on Twitter anymore because that thing got blown all to hell. Uh, yeah. so I did, I did get the coveted blue sky invite. Um, nice. so, so I'm on blue sky or blue ski where, um, where a bunch of people who are used to saying things and having people respond to them are just saying things and having nobody respond to them because nobody's yeah. there. And so everybody's really <laughs> frustrated because they're like, nobody likes the things that used to generate all this engagement and like dopamine yeah. hits for my brain, but nobody's yes. getting those in there anymore. So it's a bunch of like true posters going slowly insane because there's no audience, Yes, um, which is that fun. Is, so I am, I am I, on that. I love it. <clears throat> 
but I am uh, I am about to start a third my third podcast, which will be a uh, a show about history and history books mostly. Like it'll be like 85 percent history books uh, with a woman named Alexis Ko, who is mm-hmm. a uh, presidential biographer herself, and we've been friends for a while, and uh, decided to start up the show, which will be called the Duncan and Co History Show which you'll be able to find wherever you find this podcast, uh, whenever yeah. it is that we actually get it out the door, which will be in the next few months. So do you guys do a new book every episode or do you go uh, yeah. into... Okay. No, it'll. I think it'll, it'll be a weekly show. Um, it'll come out on Tuesdays, which is pub day in the industry. So hopefully once we sort of build it up a little bit, if you've got a new history book coming out uh, on this Tuesday on pub day, we would be the place that you would come to uh, and talk about your book and have your book get sort of, uh, you know, chatted about and blasted out to all the people that we can drag in. And we're going to try to combine our whatever clout we have um, to hopefully like new authors, you know, people that might not otherwise get any kind of visibility at all to, yeah. to you know, give them, a, give them a bigger profile and kind of get them out the door because both Alexis and I have written books and we know how hard it is to make it out there and promote them. Yeah. And get any get anybody to notice what's going on. So that's the idea. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm very much looking forward to it uh, at this point. Um, you know, I've listened to Revolutions so many times that I'm like, I need, I need some, I need some new Mike Duncan content. So I'm very excited for your new show, new Mike, and it's all just conversational. You know, it'll just uh, be like this. There's no, I'm, I'm done. I'm done scripting podcast episodes for a little while. Oh, yeah. good for you. That a, sounds like a a hell. Break. Yeah. See, this was, is this is what an unscripted podcast looks like. It's mostly just talking about what guy you'd fuck. Hopefully that'll come up on the show. I hope it does. Why Mike not? Duncan, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks a lot. Bye. Patreon.com slash broadcast. The $8 tier gets you a shout out. Vince, we have very many shout outs this week. Let's uh, do it. Yeah, we're just catching up. Um all right, so the first is Adam Molson. Molson, what is this guy? A Canadian beer? Uh, I'm gonna call him. I'm gonna call him a Labatt. Okay, Labatt. Mm-hmm. I like it. I get it. Uh, next is uh, it's Siad or Saeed uh, Sulejman Pesic. Fuck, bro. Saeed. Oh, like right, Saeed Fred. I'm gonna, Fried. I'm gonna call this guy. <laughs> I'm going to call this guy Too Sexy. Too Sexy. Yeah, there we go. Um, it could be also C. Ed, but r- right, C. Ed Fred also works. So um, so Too Sexy works no matter what. Uh, next, Rusty Shackleford. Yeah, we call this guy Trombone. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, works. Uh, then we have Ivan Puga, uh, Pugachev. 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 We call this guy Puka Shells. Love it. Mm-hmm. Uh, next is David Cass. I feel, didn't we already give this guy a nickname? Um, he probably, he, if I did it again, it means that he re-upped again for another eight. David Cass, Mama Cass, uh, Ham Sam. I'm going to call this Ham- guy Hamsterdam. Oh, uh, you, you know, you trick. I thought you were going to go ham sandwich. You went Hamsterdam. Mm-hmm. I'm very impressed. No, it's, I'm fitting it in. You're doing great. Uh, three more left. We have just Kristen. I wasn't able to find a last name, mm. uh, but Kristen, you're, you you know who you are. Hey, I'm Kristen here. Um, geez, ooh, what do we do with just Kristen? Uh, so we're gonna call her Special K. Special K. I love it. Uh, now we have Mike Van Herk. Uh, ooh, Van Herk. He's Herkin. In a van, uh, maybe we just call him uh, Triando. I love it, Triando. He's Herc in a van. Uh, and finally, Jacob Sawyer. Jacob Sawyer. He's like today's Tom Sawyer. Uh, we're gonna call this guy Rush. Okay. Yeah. All great names. And I hope everyone who got one enjoyed it. Vince, you're so good at this. Oof, thank you for saying. Just, I mean, they feel just, pretty tossed on. off, but, you know, that's kind of my style. I don't think so at all. I think people love their names. And you can get your own at patreon.com slash frockcast, where you can also get bonus episodes of the show. Uh, well, you can get the frockcast, which is me and Vince just talking about stuff with a guest. It's, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun. And we need you to join. So please join. It's great. 
Uh, and also, um, we have a bunch of uh, more names to read off, but, you know, from the in between the seasons thing. So if you haven't heard your name, it's probably coming up. So just don't yell at me. Frogcast at gmail.com for all your questions, comments, and concerns. Vince, what is the Google Voice number? 415 275 0030. All right, everyone. Thanks again so much for listening. And until next time, if you come at the king, you best not, man. Some of it was good. This is one of them easy ones.